Hi, and welcome to Rave Leader Chat for Confronting Christianity, week number six, uh, on the topic of can we take the Bible literally? Um, one of the real gifts that uh, Rebecca McLaughlin gives us is that she addresses some of these cultural questions, these challenges that people have toward Christianity, and uh, she talks about them in uh, a way that, A, oftentimes appeals to general revelation, uh, so not specific scriptural texts, but uh, general things that we know um, and also really appeals to sort of a, a regular logic. And we see that take place again in this chapter. So she gets out of the books, uh, blocks pretty well, and this time she sort of just a, a gives us sort of a statement about what she's going to be doing. Um, she sort of talks a little bit about some of the confusion about Scripture, and then she just tells us kind of the thesis statement for the chapter on page uh, 96. Uh, we will explore the misconception that it's inconsistent to read some biblical passages literally and others not. Now, she really sort of addresses three different topics uh, in this, this chapter as we approach Scripture. And so the first one is really that figurative language question. Do we take the Bible literally? Now, as Christians, we take the Bible seriously. We believe that all Scripture is God-breathed and useful. And so that's part of the uh, place that we start with, uh, but that oftentimes gets misinterpreted. And sometimes in our defense, in our, our desire to, to say very firmly how strong we believe in Scripture, um, we can be, get to the point where we overstate um, our approach in saying that we take it all literally. Um, and so she kind of walks into that uh, a sort of assumption and that pigeonholing that sometimes takes place out there and she quickly sort of walks through it. She gives us that quick survey that says lots of pastors even would say, yeah, we take the whole thing literally. And really a better position is we take the whole thing seriously. Um, much like Matthew chapter 5, we, we take every uh, dot and tittle very seriously. We don't uh, dismiss it. We come under its authority. We seek it. But we also realize that it is a very complex document. And it is uh, filled with many genres of literature. And so she helps walk us through that. So first she talks about Jesus' use of metaphors. Jesus very intentionally. He says, I'm the, the shepherd. Um, I'm, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the true vine. Um, and so we, we know that he is very intentional multiple times about using uh, figurative language. And, you know, she sort of talks about uh, this godly order that God created these these. Uh, things that we look at. Um, God being father defines all fatherhood, not human fathers defining what God looks like. Uh, same thing with the bridegroom. Uh, human marriage really is a, a uh, an expression that we might plug into the larger relationship that Christ has with his church. Um, and so we, we want to be open to that. And so she kind of talks through a, a little bit about uh, metaphors and, and what we do about that. And once she sort of opens that door, she prepares us for that second wave, well, if we don't take some parts literally, we shouldn't take all parts seriously, particularly miracles and those kind of things. And so she really sort of tries to say, well, wait a second, let's, we need to ask a, a bigger question. Uh, we need to get to sort of the question of genre and intent. Um, you know, I, one of the things that comes to mind is the, the Swiss Army knife. Um, if you were to take out the corkscrew part of a Swiss Army knife, uh, it would be a fair statement to say, well, that's a terrible knife. But the Swiss Army knife is really more of a multi-tool. It's labeled a knife. The Bible is really a library that tends to get labeled as a book. And even in some of those specific books in that library, there's sometimes figurative language. And so she kind of walks through um, the true, while not literal, aspects of Scripture, um, parables and poetry. Uh, there's places that Jesus speaks very clearly. Uh, I'm telling you a, a parable, and although they sound very, very real, we understand that Jesus isn't actually describing something that he's seen or something that he specifically experienced. He's utilizing things that people had at their disposal and understanding uh, to highlight great truths. And some of these uh, metaphors and some of these parables are very complex. And so we, we oftentimes want to dismiss them to say, well, you know, it's just he's speaking to simple people. Um, but no, he really is uh, utilizing th that uh, literary tool very well. And so she reminds us of something very important on page 99. 
Uh, first, we must be very careful to distinguish between true and literal. Uh, they're different. Things can be true while they're metaphorical, and uh, just because something is literal doesn't necessarily make it true. And then secondly, and she calls us to that, that Swiss Army knife example, we must be attentive to the genre, the style of any biblical text in order to grasp its meaning. And so she really kind of addresses that first. Do we take it literally? And her answer would be, no, we don't take all of it literally. Um, we utilize our reason and our understanding and our experience as readers and as uh, people being shaped in God's image who have been given reason and understanding um, to understand that when we're talking about poetry, the Psalms, when we're talking about parables, um, sometimes Jesus speaks in hyperbola. Um, those kind of things, we'll, we need to take that figuratively, but that doesn't mean that all the rest of Scripture should be taken figuratively, can really be taken literally. Jesus literally died on the cross. Jesus literally rose from the dead. Uh, so she does a great job in kind of helping us uh, parse that out. Um, next thing she gets to is, well, another kind of cultural uh, assumption is, well, wait a second, um, isn't the Bible full of contradictions? I mean, there's four Gospels, right? There's four different stories about Jesus. And, you know, as you put those together, they don't tend to always line up in, in the order that things took place. Um, sometimes people say, well, wait a second, the, the feeding of the 4,000 and the 5,000, is that the same story twice? Um, and so she kind of talks through some of those contradictions, going back to Genesis 1, 1 and 2, and reminds us that sometimes we write from a theological perspective. And uh, there's a great quote on page 100, um, about uh, sort of the intentional use of paradox. The presence of such deliberate formal contradictions does not mean that the contradictory statements are not both true in some deeper way. And so she walks us through that with Genesis 1 and 2, that uh, you're talking theologically about a couple different realities, and then also how Jesus uh, tends to use that same kind of contradiction, that simultaneously Jesus is the good shepherd and the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You know, literally that doesn't make sense. Jesus can't be the shepherd and the lamb and also the high priest, the great high priest who would offer that sacrifice. That, that's just impossible if we take that literally. But figuratively, all those are true in a very, very deep way. Uh, and in Jesus, we have the great high priest who has gone before us, who offers himself as the sacrificial lamb because he is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his friends. Uh, and so she masterfully sort of unpacks that for us pretty quickly. She dives a little bit deeper into the topic of contradictions with gospel contradictions. Aren't there uh, myths, things that don't align very well? And she does a good job of kind of walking through uh, three different quick reasons for why we might see those contradictions. Um, I always like to say that, you know, Scripture might look uh, contradictory or unclear, from our perspective, but from God's perspective, that's not true. And so she sort of offers a couple reasons why that sometimes might seem true. She says some uh, stem from uh, the assumption of things can only take place once. And she reminds us that Jesus did lots of things, not everything that's written down. This is uh, very intentionally uh, parts of his story chosen for a particular purpose, written by a particular person toward a particular audience. And that's important to remember as well. Second, she gets us to a mistake we oftentimes make that we oftentimes apply our modern sense of timing and narrative and the norms of historical accounts uh, to a style of literature that didn't subscribe to all of our modern things. A real quick side for that, we, we sort of do the same thing. If some other culture uh, were to come and, and watch our newscasts, they would think that we're very simple people because we say that the sun rose and the sun sets uh, and it would, it would communicate a unscientific understanding of that the sun is the center of the universe. Um, we look at it and go that way. We, that's just figurative language. We utilize it that way. Uh, same thing. We can't apply all of our modern uh, scientific understandings to every aspect of Scripture and expect it to, to do that. And third, uh, she talks about our, our sense of uh, location, that we don't know the landscape very well. And sometimes things can be known by multiple names. Uh, the, the example she gives is the uh, Bethany and the Mount of Olives, which really are synonymous in, in part, uh, one is a subset of the other. Um, then she kind of gets to that, that lingering uh, cultural question about, wait a second, what, there, aren't there other Gospels? There's a, there's a cover-up going on here, right? Um, Gospel Thomas got a, lot of, got a plug a while ago, and maybe there's some other Gospels out there. 
And she really does a good job of saying um, that the Gospels really are the reliable ones. There's a, a great quote that I'm not going to be able to find really quick here um, from Bart Ehrlman. The view of all serious historians in antiquity of every kind, from committed evangelical Christian to hardcore atheists, is that the best and oldest sources we have uh, about the life of Jesus are the four Gospels that we have. Uh, so she kind of unplugs that one. But she turns to the third topic then, which is really, can we trust the authenticity of Scripture? Um, if this is the best resource we have to the life and ministry of Jesus, can we trust the authenticity? And she offers really sort of two things. Um, one is the, the eyewitness details that are included in the Scriptures. Uh, and so she plugs a couple, a lot of name dropping in the Gospel of Mark, which really doesn't make sense if, if, you know, for people who wouldn't know these names, but why would you add those names? You'd add those names because it adds authenticity. They're guarantors of the truth. Um, if you want to go talk to Simon of Cyrene or his kids, you can go do that, and you know that, uh, that these things can be substantiated. Uh, and if that's not the case, then you need to hold off on writing for a long time until all the eyewitnesses are dead. And so that's a very compelling reason why we can trust Scripture. And uh, the last thing she sort of uh, highlights is uh, things that would not be wise to include in a first century document, um, women being the first eyewitnesses to the, to the resurrection. Um, and, you know, it, it, women were not counted as uh, reliable witnesses back then, but yet the gospel and the gospel writers, knowing that that's countercultural, include that in story because it happened to tell it differently would not be correct. Um, you know, Peter, who's probably uh, really good friends with Mark and, and has heard, Mark has heard Peter's story, Peter doesn't say, you know, I was the first one to the tomb. I, I was the leader. Like, I look great, right? No, uh, the women were first there. And then they came back and told us, and then John and I went, um, because that's really what happened. And then second, she talks about the honest, speaking of Peter, the honest failings that are included in uh, the Gospels. And those honest failings are included because they speak to the patience, to the grace uh, to, of Jesus Christ and to the ups and downs of, of discipleship and faith formation. And again, if you're writing this to try to make yourself look good, if you're writing this to sell this as, as a popular, wouldn't you want a, uh, a hero that rises at a mercurial rate rather than someone like Peter who stumbles and falls and gets back up and stumbles and gets back up and stumbles? Um, and yet that's really... Again, the authenticity. Uh, so question four sort of says, you know, she cites lots of scripture in passing on that. Um, which one of these might be most, uh, you know, powerful for you? Uh, for our, our scripture this reading this week in the sermon, there's lots we could have chosen. I, I sort of already r reminded us of Matthew chapter five. Um, but we're going to look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter three. Uh, and I just want to give you verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, uh, that the child of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Um, that verse is very central for me in our understanding of why we approach scripture the way we approach it. Uh, first, the Holy Spirit has helped not only breathe inspire the writers as they wrote it, but the Holy Spirit meets us, according to John's Gospel, chapter 14, the Holy Spirit meets us in these pages and brings it to life and teaches us and reminds us of everything we need to know. So, not, first of all, all Scripture is inspired. And second, all Scripture is useful. But sometimes that usefulness might be foreign to us, but when we understand the genre, when we understand the context better, um, we can see God's purpose for us more clearly. So fantastic chapter. I hope you have a great conversation. I hope this really equips your group to kind of go out. And as I think about our six marks of discipleship, you know, this really sort of reminds us of the importance of Bible study and Bible discovery, uh, but also equipping us to go out and share the good news with others uh, as we try, try to reach out to others who are far off from God and help them understand the good news is for them. Uh, you know, the book of Romans says that the, the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ, uh, has the power to transform and save lives. And so one of the, the best things we can do is in our conversations with people who are far from God is to continue to, to invite them to discover the book, come back to the stories, come back to the place that the Holy Spirit can bring these words to life and transform them. Take care and God bless.